our third of the lecture series. Uh, my name is Rod Smith. I uh, am a professor here at the law school, and I direct the sports law and business program. Uh, that is a joint effort directed by the law school, but with the W.P. Carey School of Business, and many of our students are here. While this is our third uh, monthly series, it was the first one, uh, as soon as I came on board, that I sought put together. And I did it very, very intentionally. Now, of course, given their schedules, getting our speakers together at a time meant they were going to be third, not, not first. But in introducing our speakers, and I want to be quick because you want to hear from them and not from me. Uh, I, the reason I pick Armin and Jeff is not simply because Jeff is one of my dear friends and I'm becoming increasingly a friend of Armin's is easy to do. But my number one reason, and you know something of their background, uh, I think Jeff is uh, one of the finest writers I know. He's even wrote two bestsellers while he was in law school. So I don't want any of the law students to complain that they're having to work too hard. And he used those wonderful skills, and you can see him in his work. He's had a number of New York Times bestsellers. Also writes for Sports Illustrated. Uh, he is also, I can make that clear, both that thing. He is also immensely decent, and I would trust him with any. I would trust him with the lives of my children and grandchildren. He is that kind of person. And why he, or why, uh, I, I think, now I learned last night at dinner why he is that person, and that's because Armin taught him all. <laughs> Because that is true of Armin, too. And Armin's won 11, maybe more now, enemies. Uh, he's been, uh, I, I know the, no sports journalist who is more professional, more thorough, more able. He earns the trust of the people he works with because he knows what they will get is both fairness, which actually is much better than balance. We talked about that last night. But they will also get all the facts. That he will, and that's true of both of them. I so back to why were they first? Because for those of you that are in the sports law business program, we are not about preparing fans. We're about preparing professionals. There are no two more professional people working in journalism in this area than Jeff Benedict and Armin Kitaev. So I turn the time first over to uh, Jeff, and he in turn will turn the time over to Armin, and welcome everyone. It's really great to be here because the weather back home stinks. <laughs> this is marvelous. Uh, Armin and I have been freezing for the last week, and when we got off the plane here yesterday, it was it was like arriving in heaven, so you can see why they're all here. Uh, I want to thank Rod for uh, those kind words. I've known Rod for a little over seven years now, and um, Rod 
is a really dear friend, but he's, uh, you know, he's probably one of the kindest human beings I've ever met. And um, uh, I'm really grateful that he's generous enough to invite us to come out here and uh, spend a part of the afternoon with uh, his students uh, here at the program. Um, and I'm grateful to be here with Armin. Uh, I'm going to contain my remarks today because I just want to talk about one principle that whether you're going into business or law or actually whether you're going into any profession or into a marriage, this principle applies. Um, Rob alluded to it. I, I want to talk about trust because uh, trust is a, a critical aspect of what uh, I do in my profession. And when I was a, a law student, um, I, I don't have a journalism degree, by the way. I, I have a law degree. Uh, I went to law school to become a lawyer, naturally not a writer. Um, but I started writing full time when I was in my first year of law school. I, I learned early on that uh, trust is, is like a calling card for this job. And I want to use an illustration from the book that Arnon and I did uh, last year called The System about college football. Uh, I want to just, I'm going to tell you a story from our reporting that will illustrate the point that I'm talking about. When Arnon and I set out to do the system, we, uh, we kind of did a, a diagram and we were looking for all the different component parts that make college football work. Uh, there's the obvious ones like players and coaches, but when you start naming them all, you realize there's a lot of other positions that make this game go. Uh, college presidents, boosters who supply money, tutors who work with the athletes, hostesses who accompany them when they first come to campus, um, assistant coaches, strength coaches, it just, the list goes on and on and on. When we were making that list, we wanted to find one person in each category that we could profile in our book. And when I say profile, I mean let us follow you around and see your world. And the coach we wanted to get was Mike Leach. And the reason for that is because right when we signed a book contract, Mike Leach signed a new coaching contract at Washington State University, one of your Pac-12 opponents. After being out of a job for two years because he'd been fired at Texas Tech for putting a kid with a concussion in a confined space and making him stand there in the dark for two hours. At least that was the story. And it was one of the most notorious, controversial incidents in college football probably in the last 50 years. Everybody who knows anything about college football knows about that incident. Um, and at the time that Mike Leach lost his job at Texas Tech, he was coach of the year. He was the best coach in college football. And he had just taken Texas Tech uh, to number three in the country with a team that was full of players that Texas Oklahoma and, and other big schools in that area had passed over. Uh, that was the guy. And so we wanted to see if Mike would let us follow him through his inaugural season at Washington State. We, we kind of let us just shadow him and see what happens to him for a year. But neither Armin nor I, neither Armin nor I knew him personally. We knew a lot of people in the game, but we didn't know him. And we really didn't know anybody who knew him. And so this was a cold call. And um, the way we divide it up, that just that happened to fall to me. When you're doing stuff like that, or like what we do, one of the things that's really important is to try to find something that you can make a connection with quickly with that person, to establish some relationship. If you have no relationship with someone, you're looking for something that will enable you to jumpstart quickly because you don't, you don't have a lot of time, especially with a coach. He's either going to talk to you or he's not. And I had nothing. But when I initially called him, and I told him who we were and what we were doing, and I said, uh, I told him what we wanted to do. And the first thing he said to me was, well, have you read my book? And I hadn't. He had just written a book called Swing Your Sword. And it was sort of his, his defense of what happened at Texas Tech. Um, I had the book, but I hadn't started reading it yet. I told him, I have it, I will read it. He said, why don't you do that, call me back. So I immediately started doing that. And in the first or second chapter, I, I learned something that I didn't know about him, which was that uh, he'd gone to Brigham Young University. I had no idea. And I thought, that's odd. And, and then I saw that he was from Wyoming. And I kind of was putting two and two together. I thought, kid from Wyoming, a lot of Mormons, Brigham Young University, Mormon school, maybe he is one. And I thought, well, maybe that's my connection, because I'm one. And I thought, oh, so I called him back thinking this is a good thing. And I said, uh, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm reading your book and I see that you went to BYU. I said, are you a Mormon? Long pause. 
That's usually not a good thing. <laughs> so uh, he said, well, you know, Mike's got this great voice. You know, uh, well, you know, uh, he's doing that thing. And I thought, OK. And I wasn't sure what all that meant. But I realized this might not be the connection that I thought it was going to be. He agreed to let me fly out there. And when I went out there, the first time it was, uh, you know, it's winter. It's the off season. So he's recruiting in there, getting ready for spring ball and all this other stuff. And I'm hanging around there. And I, I'm noticing stuff. You know, like he likes to chew tobacco. He loves the F word. He, uh, you know, drinks a lot of coffee. Things that aren't in line with the Mormon faith. None of those. Like, and so I was starting, okay. And then I met his wife over dinner and I find out she's a Mormon and goes to church and all this stuff. And uh, what I realized as I was starting to do this is I thought, he, he thinks, because I'm one, and I'm going to, like this is going to change the way I look at him. Right? That's the, that's the problem. And so when the, in fact, when we were at a practice that first weekend, uh, the guys were running routes and stuff, and I'm standing next to Mike, and I got my little tape recorder in my pocket because I'm taping everything. And he's got the big jaw on his lip, and he's spitting on the field and everything. And he, he says, by the way, uh, don't put that in the book. You know, I don't want to chew and stuff in there. And uh, I said, you know, don't worry about it. And uh, at the end of the week, I said, and don't worry about the other stuff. You know, all this other stuff, like who you are and language and all that. I said, I, I would be really disappointed if you changed that because I'm around. You know, I'm here to watch you be you. I don't want you to change who you are because me, that, that's not going to be good. You need to be yourself. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you say. I don't care what language you use. I don't care what you drink. I don't care what you chew or what you eat. You know, that's, not, that's actually not really any of my business. I'm here as a professional. You know, I, I want to see you in your element. So when the, we got deep into this case and when we, when we started digging in, we realized this concussion case is pretty complicated. It's really complicated, actually, because the kid who had the concussion, it's a mild concussion, but he's, he's the son of uh, Craig James, the ESPN football analyst who played in the NFL. His son's a wide receiver on the Texas Tech team, and him and Mike don't really get along that well. In fact, there's been tension for a number of years. There's other guys on this team, like Michael Crabtree, who's now on the 49ers, and there's a, Mike connects really good with guys like Crabtree, but he didn't connect good with Craig's son. And so, then comes this incident where Craig's son doesn't show up for practice. It's, it's a couple weeks before a big bowl game. And then he finally strolls onto the field late, like almost 30 minutes late. And he's like dressed down. You know, he's, he's not in, certainly not in uniform, but he's not even dressed like these guys here are, are kind of <coughs> sweat, sweat gear. He's not even in that. And that's the protocol when you're hurt, is you come to practice, you dress like that. He's got the baseball cap on backwards and the blue jeans, and he's you know, kind of strutting and slow. It draws the attention of the whole team, and Mike gets angry. So he, he turns to the trainer, and I won't use his exact language here, but he says basically, what, what's, what's he doing? Why is he late? And the trainer then informs him, well, last night at the end of practice, he got a concussion. This is the first time the coach is hearing about this. So this is news to him. He's angry because of the scene that's being created, the lateness and the broken protocol, which has happened before. And so, in an instant, he turns the trainer and he directs him to take the guy and put him in a dark space and leave him there till the end of practice. So the trainer takes him to what is like an athletic equipment storage shed that's off the, just off the field. It's out of sight from the rest of the players. And in there, they got stuff like blocking dummies and water coolers and you know stuff like that. And the trainer takes him in there and he tells him, you need to stay in here until practice is over. Uh, don't come out. And they turn the lights off. Dark. He's got a concussion. That turns into a big problem. Because while he's in there, he text, starts texting his father. He tells him what's going on. His father gets angry. This thing builds. And it, it builds and builds. Bottom line is, two days later, they have another practice. And, and he's still on the protocol concussion. So for seven days, he can't practice. So when he comes back in two days, Mike has the trainer do it again. This time they're practicing in the stadium instead of on the practice field. So the, the guy takes him under the stadium into the media room, which is a room that's about a third the size of this. 
And in the media room, this is where all the reporters go after the game to interview the players and stuff. And in that room, there's a little clock. It's got electrical equipment in it, wires. And the trainer puts them in there and says, this time stay in here. But you know, I mean, he says, don't go in here, actually. Stay in the media room, but don't go in this closet. And after he leaves, Adam James goes in the closet and take, makes a video of himself on his phone in the closet. And that video is going to end up on the internet. Okay? That's the background of the story. But when this comes out, it comes out because the parents complain. I mean, Craig James goes to the president of the university. I mean, he doesn't go to the coach, he doesn't go to the AD, he goes to the chancellor of Texas Tech. And he says, you know, he's angry. And he wants Mike to lose his job. And so now you have this tension, and the university, the chancellor comes to the coach, the best coach in the country, and he says, uh, look, we want you to, basically want you to apologize in writing. Uh, we want a commitment that you're never going to do anything like this again. It's kind of a series of things. Well, Mike looks at all this and decides he doesn't want to do any of it. He's not signing anything. He's not apologizing. He doesn't want to do anything. And so you have this, this is the tension. Well, as we're working through this story, I, I've gotten pretty close to Mike. And that can happen when, you, when you're shouting someone who's spent a lot of time with them. You can, you, can, uh, you can get close to a person. And that, that happened to me. One of the things I was concerned about is this, the story has to, it's got to be true. And it's got to have the perspective of not just Mike, who's our, who's our guy, but it's got to have the chancellor of the university who fired him. It's got to have the athletic director who was involved in the controversy. It's got to have Craig James, who, who wanted him fired. So we interviewed all those people. I interviewed all those people, and we got this really well-rounded story. And it was layered, and it, it made sense. And, um, but there's this thing. When we got into it, we were looking at uh, medical records and depositions, because when Mike lost a job, lawsuits got filed. He sued the university for wrongful termination. There was all kinds of stuff back and forth. And those lawsuits were pending when we were writing our book. They were not resolved. So when you're writing about something that's in litigation, that can be really tricky. I mean, you want to be careful you don't get sued yourself. And so um, I read all the depositions in the case. And one of the things I found in the depositions were there were these affidavits. And those of you who are in the law program, you know what an affidavit is, right? It's a sworn statement where someone is stating something under oath. And there was an affidavit from the trainer. So this is the guy who's at practice when the coach tells him what to do with the player with a concussion. That guy wrote out an affidavit, and I read the affidavit. And the affidavit was, was very explicit. And it said exactly what Mike had said to the trainer when he told him to put the kid in the closet. And it was, you know, it was pretty vulgar. The language was rough. And so if you, if you took that statement and just isolated it by itself and read it without any context, you'd go, bad guy, bad guy, should get fired, should lose his job. And, and I knew that, Armin knew that. I mean, when you read that statement, it's like, ooh. But, it doesn't, but it's a statement with no context around it. Like, it. It doesn't have any reference point if you read it on its own. What we knew, because we'd spent so much time with him and these other players, was Mike talks like that all the time. That's, in the football world, he's, that's how he talks. And so we had to make a decision in the chapter before the concussion <coughs> case is, what's the portrayal going to be? And I'm writing that portrayal. And so um, I, I chose to use a lot of foul language in that chapter. And I did that for a reason. It's not because I like it, you know, or because I was trying to celebrate it, but I was trying to get the context right so that when you read what he does later, you don't jump to the wrong conclusion about who he is and what he's doing. And, and that's why we did that. And then at the end of our process, and this is where trust comes in, um, because Mike, as with Nick Saban and a few other people who gave us extraordinary access, um, we allowed those people to get the book before the public got it. That's just a courtesy you should do. I mean, you shouldn't shock people who let you run around them for a year and then get a call that you don't want to take when they're angry because they're reading something that they weren't expecting. So I, Mike was one of the people on our short list that we thought should read the manuscript in advance before publication. We're not going to change things. That's not the point. 
and we're past that. This book is in print. It's just they should read it before everybody else and have a chance to prepare and talk to you and all that stuff. When Mike read the chapter, he called me and he said, uh, what do you think people are going to think of me when they read this? And I said, well, I'm not sure. Um, I said, but I can tell you that I let my wife read it and my wife hates football. She thinks it's stupid. And uh, just a dumb game. She doesn't like it. But she read it. And when she read the chapter on you, uh, she liked it. And she liked you. Uh, and she hates four-letter words, especially the F word. She, she never uses the words. But even after reading all that, uh, her impression of you was favorable. And Mike, she could kind of like, he took a deep breath and so did I. I was relieved. And then he said, and this is how I knew we were good. He goes, well, he says, you tell Lydia, my wife's name is Lydia, he goes, you tell Lydia, if she ever wants to take up swimming, I'll give her a few tips. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And it came out and it went. And, uh, and one of the first emails I got when the system went on sale was from the Chancellor of Texas Tech. He and Mike have been going like this for five years. Five years. In court, in public. And he didn't want to cooperate with the system either because he, when, he, when I first called him, he said, well, are you working for Mike Leach? No. Is Mike Leach paying you? No. Is this going to be a hatchet job in Texas Tech? No. And all that stuff. And then finally he agreed and we did the interviews. When the book came out, the chancellor emailed me and he said, um, he said, this was the most honest and complete uh, description of what actually happened here that's been written. And I didn't do, we didn't do a promo job for Texas Tech. We, but the thing was, we did go to everybody. And it wasn't just like, can we get a comment from you? We actually let everybody, we wanted Texas Tech's whole view. And some of the things they t told us that went in the book were not favorable to Mike Leach. But you know what? It was, it was honest. And that's the thing I think people are looking for the most, is they want you to tell them the truth. Tell them what you're going to do, and then do what you say. And if you can do that, because most people don't, uh, that's how you gain trust that leads to the next guy opening the door for you. And so um, I'm going to turn the time over to Armin because um, he's going to talk about something different. And then after Armin, uh, together we'll take some questions. Very nice. Good work. Good work. Good work. I'm going to stand behind a lecture because I like to write things down. And uh, if I'm out there reading, it's going to look a little funky. But uh, as Jeff mentioned, he's a lawyer. And as I like to say, I just like to play a lawyer on television. Um, I do that a lot and have done it a lot over the course of my career. Um, as Rod mentioned, uh, you know, I've had, I think, a pretty pretty versatile, pretty complete career, um, both in print and in, and in television. Uh, I started out on a weekly newspaper in San Diego uh, in 1978, where they literally threw it on the doorstep of people on Wednesday afternoon. It was a shopper, and uh, it was full of ads, and I was the sports editor of what was the, called the Life News. We called it uh, charitably the Death News, because it was, there wasn't much going on. And uh, I was a sports editor because I was the only one in the sports department, so I could call myself a sports editor. Mm -hmm. Covered high school football and, and, and worked my way up from a, a suburban, from a weekly newspaper to a suburban daily where I worked for two years um, to the San Diego Union and San Diego Magazine. And then um, the first of several big breaks in my life, I was hired by Sports Illustrated in 1982 <coughs> as a, a, it was a reporter, but essentially it was a glorified fact checker. Uh, my job was to put little red marks through every single word that was written by a Sports Illustrated writer. Um, now I'm 29 years old. I left a, um, a house, two dogs, two cars um, in San Diego, California to move to New York City uh, with a, uh, a, a wife and a, at the time a former old. Uh, to live in a 482 square foot apartment and we measured it because at times we wanted to find out just how small it was. But it's going to, I'm going to make a point about this as I move forward. Um, I took a risk. Um, I, I had a very well established job in San Diego. 
I was one of the rising stars in the sports media business in San Diego, but I wanted to compete against the best of the best, uh, just like these guys do. They're playing in the Pac-12. Um, so I came to New York to compete against the best of the best. I was at Sports Illustrated for seven years. I ended up being the magazine's top investigative reporter. And then I got another big break in my life. Um, in 1989, I was hired by ABC World News Tonight as a network television correspondent, uh, primarily on my reporting skills. Uh, I was hired by Rune Arledge, who some of you may know, there's a Mount Rushmore intelligence broadcasting. Rune Arledge's face is on that, on that mountain. Uh, from there, I was there for, for eight years. I then went to CBS Sports. I covered the National Football League, the NFL, on the sidelines for, for eight years. I worked at Real Sports for 10 years. Um, and then I took another big change in my life when my boss, who was the, the head of both CBS News and CBS Sports, hired me to become a chief investigative correspondent for CBS News in 2006. So imagine a world of a life that was spent in the world of sports, and, and suddenly I'm I'm establishing a network television investigative gig to compete against Brian Ross and Lisa Myers and the other people that are on um, the other evening news broadcast. I spent seven years there, and then uh, another big break, I was hired, hired. I moved across the street to work on 60 Minutes Sports and 60 Minutes, where I work now as a contributing correspondent to 60 Minutes and a, um, a regular correspondent for, for 60 Sports. So, as a preamble to, I have dealt basically with issues involving sports. And I like to call them the L's. There's the ethical, there's the moral, there's the social, there's the financial, there's the medical, and more than ever, there's the legal. I deal in the legal world of sports more than I've ever dealt with it. Just think what's happened in the world of sports in the last month. Ray Rice, domestic violence, Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, wanted to legalize sports gambling. Gene Carl Stanton signing the biggest contract in the history of professional sports. Just this week, $325 million. And just yesterday, the fairness hearing in Philadelphia over this uh, massive class action lawsuit involving the NFL and concussions. Just the stories I've been working on in the last year I wrote them down and I just finished a sexual assault story that ran on 60 Sports last month, a young woman in Montana. I'm working on a story that will run next month on the NFL concussion settlement. I did a piece about the Chicago Cubs and the rise of the Cubs under the Ricketts family. Well, one big component of that was a, was a lawsuit by the, the rooftop owners against the Cubs over the renovation of Wrigley Field and the blocking of their views. I did a piece about bare knuckle boxing of all things. And is it, is it illegal or is it unsanctioned? Those words became very important during the course of the reporting of that story. So um, Jeff and I both work on what I would describe as a very high wire. Um, we're way up here at professionally. And it's taken me a long time to get there. And it's taken him a long time to get there. But that's where we work. And it's a long fall if we make a mistake. Now, you talk about the system. Overall, with four other reporters, we did 500 interviews for that book. We, we left our life for two years to go into the world of big-time college football. There has to be, I don't even know, 20,000 facts in that book. We haven't had one call from one person that said, you got it wrong. And when you think about the odds of something like that, and I would just worry about whether I spelled Nick Saban's name right. And I would literally, as I would fact check my own book, and I already had it fact checked by somebody else, I would make sure that it was three championships in the last four years. So where I'm at right now and where Jeff is, you make one misstep. And whether you're a lawyer or whether you want to be in business or whether you want to start your own social media company, um, I want to talk about five things that I think are really sort of the pillars of professionalism. Whether you're in my business or you're in businesses that I cover. Some of this is going to sound old school because I am old school. And it has served me incredibly well over the years to base my professional um, 
experience on these things. Number one, guess what? Hard work still counts. I live in a world of very, very competitive people. When I was the chief investigative correspondent at CBS News, I hired interns. And the first thing we would talk about when we were hiring them was, um, how hard do you think they're going to want to work? Are they going to show up early? Are they going to stay late? Are they going to ask me if it's okay if they can go home? Because the ones that didn't, the ones that jumped in with both feet, the ones that asked, hey, is there anything else I can do? Those are the ones we hired. We kept them on. Because those are the ones we want to come into our business. So I thought I was the hardest working guy I've ever seen. This guy puts me to shame. When we did this book together, he would call me up and he would say, and he talked about the Mike Leach situation and what happened to Texas Tech. And when Jeff decided he was going to dig into that Craig James case, I was like, good luck, buddy, because nobody's talking other than Mike. He, he would call me up and he'd, and he'd say things like, you'll never guess who I got today. I was like, who? He said, I got the judge in the case. I was like, I'm literally looking at my phone and going, you got the judge? That They were inside his, in his, um, what do they call that, Jeff? Chambers. Chambers. During his chambers, and they're talking, and Jeff is talking to the judge, and the judge is telling him what all the other attorneys are saying. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. And it's because Jeff made the phone calls. He's outworked his way to the top. I've outworked my way to the top. I've competed against the best of the best. When I came to Sports Illustrated, it was Stanford, Michigan, Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, you name it. I'm from San Diego State. I graduated from San Diego State. That's not far from Arizona State in a lot of ways. So if you think that you can't get to the top of your profession, think again. The second thing that's probably pretty clear from listening to me, I love what I do. I have a passion for what I do. I'm 61 years old. I've been doing this at the highest levels for 30 years. And I still wake up every day and want to be the best that I can be. For this concussion piece, because we're on a crash kind of situation for us, I did, I did 10 two-camera interviews in five days, from San Diego to LA to Kansas City to Denver to Boston. Almost killed me. But that's what we had to do in order to get to the place we are right now to get this piece on the air. Um, to go back to what I was talking about before, is I was willing to take a risk. I was willing to compete against the best. And what I would suggest is what you have now in this business school or this law school is a set of um, principles, whether it's learning how to argue, or learning how to research, learning how to write a cogent brief. Those things are going to serve you really, really well. Whether you end up being a lawyer, or you end up being a businessman, the kinds of things you're learning here are invaluable. The next thing is, is a skill set. At heart, I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. Don Hewitt, who started 60 Minutes, had one simple phrase, tell me a story. That's what I do. Boil down, that's what I do. But I have a skill set that allows me to do that. And it's basically three things. I'm a really good reporter. Um, I think I'm one of the better interviews that are working in television right now, interviewers, and I can write. So reporting, interviewing, writing. Now, whatever it is in, in, in law or in business, in law, can you research? Can you, can you write cogently? Can you synthesize information? Whatever it is that, that is at the heart of being a, a great attorney or a great businessman, <clears throat> figure out what those things are and become really skilled at it. Because whether I was working in newspapers or magazines or writing books or 60 Minutes or Real Sports or doing 15 second reports from the sidelines, I could report what was happening. If I had to do an interview with somebody, whether it's short or long or in between, I know how to prepare for those interviews. And I can write clear, concise, and very direct kind of writing. Number four, ethics. How I go about my business. 
If I say A and do B, I'm going to get away with it a couple of times. And I've seen it happen. Oh, coach, that's off the record. Don't worry about it. Or I never use that. In the world I live in, in the world that Jeff lives in, um, if you say A and do B, you're going to get away with it once or twice or maybe three times. You're not going to build a career on it. Because people talk. A lot of people talked to each other before they decided they were going to talk to Jeff and, and myself for the system and for every, virtually everything I do right now. I just, um, somebody I've been really wanting to do a, an interview with, and I can't really say who it is, but I've been, I wanted to do this interview with this one guy more than I wanted to do an interview with anybody for a long time. And, I mean, we dated for about a month. He called people. I had to go visit him. We went for walks in the park and talked. It was just, he wanted to know who I am. And, and as I get to my fifth point, whether he wanted to trust me. So when you get, when you talk about ethics, when you start to play around with professional ethics, whether you're an attorney, or a businessman, or somebody that wants to start Uber. I don't really care. But when you start playing around with professional ethics, you start playing around with your reputation, and you start playing around with your career. Now, I have a very unusual name, Armin Katane. People remember, for good, bad, or indifferent. So when I show up someplace, or somebody says, oh yeah, I've seen, oh yeah, you're the guy they remember that for a good reason, or they can remember it for a bad reason. So, hard work, passion, skill set, ethics. The fifth one, which I think everything boils down to and everything leads to, is the word that Jeff used, and that's mm -hmm. trust. To me, it's the most important part of the equation. Can I trust him? Is he fair? What Jeff went through with Mike Leach, I went through with Nick Saban. I wanted to profile the Alabama program because I had been around the program for a piece around 60 minutes. And when I approached Nick's people about the book, I said to this guy, Jeff, I said, I want to profile, and I knew I wasn't going to get Nick, at least not in the big, big picture. So I, I wanted to profile the smallest guy the last guy on the totem pole, because he's still on the totem pole. He looks up, Nick looks down, but he still sees the big picture. So I said, I'd like to profile the, the one, it turns out he was an assistant special teams coach. And this guy, Jeff, said to me, he goes, he goes, Armin, Nick just doesn't do this stuff. He's not going to do it. And I said, well, just ask him. He goes, okay, but I'm, t I'm telling you he's not going to do it. I said, okay. About two weeks later, the phone rings, and Jeff is on the other end, and he said, he goes, I don't know what you have on Nick Saban, but Nick Saban's going to do this. And I was like, I kind of knew he was, because I, I knew what Nick was going to do. And what Nick did, he remembered two things. One, I had done a piece on him when I worked for the CBS at the NFL today. I spent four different times down in Miami profiling Nick when he was a first year coach at Miami. He didn't want to do it then either, but his PR person said, you know what, you can trust this guy. And it turned out really well. The second part of that equation was, before Nick decided to do that, he called Bill Belichick. They're best friends, they worked together in Cleveland. Now, if I'm close to one person in the NFL who I have gained his trust over time, it was Bill Belichick. When I covered the Super Bowl, Bill came up to me and he said, hey, uh, how would you like to like, stand outside the locker room and just we'll open the door for you and just listen to, to what I'm saying to the team at halftime? He gave me that opportunity at the AFC Championship twice and he gave it to me at the Super Bowl. Now, how many NFL coaches allow stuff like that? One. In the eight years that I covered. And it's Bill Belichick who doesn't say anything to anybody. But Nick called Bill. Bill said you could trust him. Nick said yes. And I got inside the Alabama program with one low-level assistant coach who opened up a complete world for me about what was happening with Alabama. And because I had gained Nick's trust, other things happened. 
inside that program that allowed us to write about the system in a way that very, very few people have been able to write over time. So trust, and I'm going to wrap up here so we'll answer questions, but trust equals access equals information, and in my world, the last thing is that equals success. And the one reason that Jeff and I are here today is, is because you're the next generation. I'm kind of, as we said last night, I'm coming around the clubhouse turn in my career. Um, but when I'm here because I want to help people in this room understand that the ethics and the and trust and skill sets and passion and risk are really important and whether you, when you move forward in life. So we both wish you um, all the success in the world. So thank you very much. <laughs> I don't mind four letter words, so that's okay. <laughs> that, that's the one thing we're definitely going to do. Do you guys have any questions for us? Don't be shy. Yeah. Um, I think there's a time when it's difficult for me to first look kind of like you guys ethical and there's trust. I think you guys are more of a minority now compared your, your colleagues. Uh, yeah, I think we are. I, I think the media now runs from, I mean, people that write in their underwear in their mother's basement on a blog post to 60 minutes. And if you have a camera, and you have a forum, you can say things with impunity without any sort of responsibility for that. And I think professionally, I've seen some press conferences that are, um, they're just, they're an embarrassment, I think, to our profession in some ways. When you, and I'm sure you guys have heard some of these phrases that start with, can you talk about your decision to do X, Y, and Z? Why not just say, why did you decide to do this? It's a very direct question, and it's a professional question. And our business has turned into this, uh, A, I want to be your friend, or B, I'm, I'm in it to, to get Twitter followers, or C, I want to make a name for myself. Jeff and I have made a name for ourselves over a long period of time. And I'm afraid a lot of people in our business want to make a name for themselves right away for having a take on something which I find to be the wrong reasons. And that's one of the reasons, you know, again, that we're here. And I say some of this stuff publicly because, A, I think I've earned the right to say it, and B, if I don't say it or he doesn't say it, um, who's going to say it? So. You're not going to say anything there? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, other than the Mike Leach situation and the all that what do you think is the most impactful story you covered in the system? In the system? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it depends on what, you know, what moves you. For, I, I think for me, probably, the thing that I like to write about the most is redemption. Um, and I, in college football, you can find that. Uh, we, one of the stories we did in the system was about a linebacker at Brigham Young University in Kyle Van Noy, who's in the NFL now. Um, we, we had asked Kyle if he would let us profile him because when we started the system, Kyle was a sophomore in college, and he was being talked about as, a, as an early entry NFL draft guy who would come out after his junior year. And we were looking for one player that we could shadow through his junior year. We just wanted to watch him make the decision. Like, how do you decide whether to stay in school or go into the pros? That's all we knew about Kyle was that he was a great player. We didn't know the backstory. When we got in there, um, I did the Kyle story. And I remember when I first went out to ask Kyle if he'd let me do it. It was a snowy day in Provo. It was cold. And um, you know, it was just kind of a get to know each other session. No interview, no tape recorder, just talk. And uh, the next time I interviewed him was the real thing. And we were on the practice field, and it was right after their opening game of his junior year. And by then, I had read a lot more stuff about him, and I knew that in high school, he'd been arrested for drunk driving. And uh, it was very embarrassing for him and the program, because he got arrested like, right after he committed to BYU. BYU has a strict policy about drinking and all that other stuff. 
and literally two days before National Signing Day, he gets arrested for drunk driving. And uh, the, it was all over the news, so you couldn't hide from it. And the coach, uh, Bronco Mendenhall, called and told him he wasn't going to be able to come to BYU, but they were going to release his scholarship commitment in Oregon and UCLA, and a number of Pac-12 schools actually were very eager to sign him, so it wasn't going to be that bad. But he didn't want to go anywhere else. He wanted to go to BYU badly. And, um, and anyways, the bottom line was BYU made it, they basically said you'd have to be willing to sit out a year to come here so you'd be able to play for a year. And I thought that was really interesting. And so that first interview, we're sitting there, I know all that going into the first interview. Then we're sitting on the practice field, and when we got to that part of the interview, because I, I got to ask him about it, he says, uh, well, there's more to that story that you don't know. And uh, he said, no, nobody knows. And then he told me what it was, which was that right after that happened, and he promised uh, that he would sit out a year, and they promised that they'd keep him if he kept his nose clean for a year. Uh, a month later, he got arrested again. And nobody knew that. Like, that had never been reported. And um, when he told me that, I was, frankly, I was startled, stunned. Um, and I immediately went to the head coach, and I said, what did you, you know, what's going on here? How did you do this? And uh, he told me a story. He said, Brock um, Benno's a really strict guy. I mean, he's not recruited a lot of players who have issues off the field. He said that he always felt compelled that this was a kid who needed to come to Brigham Young University. And he said, so when it happened the second time, he goes, the thing was, the second time, we didn't know he'd been arrested the second time. And we never would have known. Because the second time, it didn't make it to the newspaper. It was secret. You know, you ever been in one of those situations where you've done something and you're glad no one knows, right? Nobody knows you did something, and that's kind of, it's embarrassing when people find out. Well, Kyle got on an airplane and flew to Provo on his own and showed up in the coach's office and confessed. That's how the school found out he'd been arrested against, because he told them. And it was that, that fact that prompted the coach to say, this is a kid I want to keep. And so he kept him. And the athletic department, director and the, and the dean at BYU was very skeptical of that decision. And they basically told the coach, if this goes south, it's going to be on you. And it didn't go south. He stayed four years, and actually, while we were doing the book, after his junior year, he could have gone pro, and he decided to stay in school because he wanted to graduate. And, um, and I remember the day he made that decision, it was, it was over Christmas, and he called me right after the bowl game. I thought for sure he was going into the pro. And he called me and he said, I've decided to stay in school. And I said, why are you doing that? You know, and he said, well, I kind of figured that if a lot of kids are going to look, look at me and they're going to look at what I've done and now everybody knows what I've done. And people, the kids will say, you know, if Kyle, if Kyle can do this, I can do this. And so he stayed and now he's on the Lions and he's playing, he's married, he's happy, and his life has changed. And I, I had... Lots and lots of people who go to other schools who said that was the most inspiring story in the book. But I think it depends. It really does depend what inspires you. Like to me, I, I love stories like that. That's more exciting to me than some kid scoring a touchdown with three seconds left. You know, um, this is stuff that's more real life. And, and we had a number of stories like that in the book. Um, Kyle's was one. Good one. I mean, for me, just quickly, it would be two things time and money actually money and time, the massive amounts of money that were pouring into college football, whether they were on the regional television networks, the Pac-12 network, the SEC network. Um, Ricky Seals-Jones, who's now a starting wide receiver for Texas A&M, the fact that, that his father had been offered $600,000 by two different schools for him to sign with those schools. He didn't sign with either one of them. Um, coaching salaries. The, to the level that they've risen to right now, ESPN's um, six billion dollar playoff um, payment to the uh, to the playoff committee. We are now the conference payout for the national championship game. You guys should know this. Um, it tripled to seventy five million dollars. So if the Pac twelve team wins the national championship, the conference payout will be seventy five million dollars to that conference. Um, if it happens to be ASU, they'll get a larger slice of that pie. But just think about that for a second. And when you talk about time, 
I mean, I knew Division One football was a full-time job. I did not understand what the words full-time job meant. I mean, these guys put in 11 months a year of their life into that program. And so when you start to talk about full cost of attendance and issues involving paying players, which I don't believe in, but I certainly believe in full cost of attendance. And I certainly believe in trying to get money into the hands of the players who are most responsible for keeping these athletic departments either in the, in the black or at least afloat. But when you understand the time commitment that a major Division I athlete puts in from the beginning of fall practice, through the season, postseason, conditioning programs, spring ball, going to summer school, basically leaving this place for how long, guys? Maybe five weeks, minus 52. If you're talking a 48-week-a-year job, I get more time off. The NFL guys get more time off. So that's where, when, I'm, when I was writing and Jeff and I wrote separate chapters, and Rob was saying last night it was virtually impossible to tell one chapter for you. What it is, very hard to tell. But I'm writing from my heart for these guys because I know what they've been through and they go through um, to get to Saturday, which is the best part of the week by far, I would suggest, playing the game. So those are the kinds of things that when you do the kind of dive that we did, you come out of it and you go, you know what, you can send a message with this book. And we did in a lot of different ways, whether it was money, time, redemption, um, bringing people that were parts of the system, like hostesses, how valuable they are to the system. So that was what made it really satisfying for us. Yeah. I have a question since you brought that up, and the hostesses, and I'm trying to rectify in my mind, and since Jeff, you've written about the topic before, sex and sports, um, where's the line, and if you've seen a shift in how sex is used to sell um, either teams to players, I guess most of the teams are players, whether it's collegiate sports, NFL, or NBA. Have you seen any shift in the last 20 ish years that you've been covering that? What's your message? Um, from the system on that, because you had several chapters that addressed that. Well, not to be glib, but I think, you know, the cheerleaders are wearing a lot less clothes than they were 20 years ago, and that's just a, it's, I think it's a, it's a simplified, symbolic uh, indication that things have changed, meaning it's, uh, sex is a big part of sports. It's huge. I mean, all you have to do is uh, turn on an NFL game, and see what happens when the players are not at the top. You know, you have these uh, big, incredibly strong, huge guys, uh, you know, black chalk under their eyes, helmets on their faces, and they run out and they run between, you know, sculpted girls that are wearing almost nothing or jumping up and down. And uh, it's, it's an incredible contrast when you think about that. And um, so when we were, when we were doing the system, the reason we wanted to look at hostess is because the first person that a college athlete really spends time with when they get recruited is a pretty girl. You know, um, it's a pretty girl that's going to walk around. They're going to spend more time with a pretty girl than they're going to with a coach. Coach isn't going to take them to the movie or take them out for ice cream or show them around the campus. Coach doesn't do that. Pretty girl does that for a reason. And uh, I, I think the hostess factor, at least in the SEC, which is what we were focusing on, uh, hostesses play a really important role in decisions that players make because what we saw in the SEC was that the girls were uh, using social media channels, they were using Skype, they were using Facebook, they were using Twitter to communicate with the recruits till 4 and 5 in the morning, you know, after they've gone home, never mind what happens when they come to campus, but after they go home, it's a way to form an intimate relationship. You can sex with a player, you know, by using those devices. And it can be a really powerful lure for that player to come to that campus. And we got in at Tennessee with Lacey Earps, and she basically taught us how they do it at Tennessee. And of course, they got in a lot of trouble there. And that was why we were looking at Tennessee, because there was a big scandal there. Um, I think, I saw this when I was a, when I was a graduate student, when I met Arnold, actually, 
20 something years ago, I was a basketball coach and at a Division I school at Northeastern. And um, I remember the first time we had home games, I'd never seen this before, but there were girls. Because I was the low man on the totem pole, I was like that assistant strength coach on the sideline. I was the films coach on the basketball game. So I literally sat in the last seat. So when girls wanted to get their phone numbers to the players, they handed them to me. You know, they'd hand me pieces of paper with their phone numbers on it, and they'd say, give it to Joe or give it to this guy. And it was my first introduction to like how, how this is going on. You know, and now I've seen it much more deeper as we've been in the game, but I just think it's a, it's a huge challenge. It's really hard, uh, I think, for players to get, to get through, certainly into the pro ranks, without falling prey to it is really, really difficult. It's because it's in your face so much. You know, and it's easy to be critical of what happens to, to the guys in these situations, but most guys have never been in these situations. They don't know what it's like to deal with the temptation and the stuff that goes at them. And I think that's why a lot of guys get tripped up when they get in trouble. And coaches, honestly, to be honest with you, most of them don't want to know about it. They don't want to deal with it because they're trying to win games. This is a distraction, and, and so they don't. And, uh, and that's why you see a lot of things that happen they shouldn't. Yeah. Can I have a follow-up? I hope you're actually, we, we're going to, we only have the room till 1.15, so we're, we're, we're tied on that. But, but here's the great news. Here's the great news as we call it. Uh, Jeff and Armin are going to be signing their book, The System. Uh, it is, I think without question, the best, most accurate overall description of all that is, we might say is good, and there is much that's good. All that's not so good, and a little bit that's ugly. Uh, but it is written with that kind of precision and detail and they will be signing and they will be available out as we're doing that. And I want to thank everyone uh, <coughs> for attending, most particularly uh, Arvin, Jeff, thank you for being with thank us. Thank you. Thanks. If you have a question or something that you want to just talk to us out there, it's, it's fine. It's fine.